everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Weekend Crusaders. My name is Sean Waskrug, and with me, as always, is Brian Michaels. Uh, yeah, um, this week is uh, we got some we got some old. Uh, I, well, I don't want to say old classics, but like classics to us at a younger age. Uh, we got a movie that's very, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we got a movie that started a uh, uh, a trend that's still going to this day. Uh, and we got a Western, and then we got a movie that literally... One of the worst movies I've ever seen. Broke Brian and I's spirit, broke Brian and I's heart. Um, literally, this movie killed us, and not in a good way. Uh, let's just start. And that's, it, yeah, let's just get it out of the way. It's it, This movie literally broke us. Um, it's our stinker film of the week. We're going to get it right out of the way, because we just want to get through this one. Uh, it's Fifty Shades of Black. My God, uh, let's get let's get through the, the stats real quick. Fifty Shades of Black, uh, 2016 came out January 29th. Had a budget of five million. Does not deserve it. Had an opening weekend of 5.9 million. Finished tenth. Doesn't deserve to be that high. Behind Kung Fu Panda three in its first week. The Revenant in its sixth week. Uh, the Force Awakens in its seventh week. The Finest Hours in its first week. Right along two in its third week, Dirty Grandpa, better than this movie, in its second week, The Boy, also better than this movie, in its second week, The Fifth Wave in its second week, and 13 Hours in its third week. Finished the box office at $22.2 million, 11.68 domestic, $10.5 million internationally. Yeah. Um, First of all, I just want to say the fact that this opens so low gives me some you know, hope for you know, society, civilization. But this is this is this is the problem that, that you and I have, Brian, is that I am outside of like the old older ones, I am not a fan of spoof movies. Um, like yes, I love space balls. I know you don't like space balls, the naked guns. Um, I mean, I really liked Walk Hard, but the great thing about Walk Hard is that Walk Hard actually made itself its own film by the end of it. But Scary Movie came out and Scary Movie was really solid. And then Scary Movie 2 came out, wasn't as good, but still was good enough. And then not another not movie. Teen movie is one of the best ones. And, and, then, and then it decided to be, let's all just make a ton of spoof movies. And we got epic movie. We got the uh, meet Deep the movie, Star movie. movie. For, or superhero movie, Haunted House, Haunted House 2, Date movie. Then they started doing all the movie specific ones. There was like, you know, uh, there was ones just about the Hunger Games. There's one just about Twilight. I don't remember the names of these things, but they were like, did very yeah, specific. Four, and they just completely obliterated the genre. The Spartans. But the one, the one thing that was a consistent flow throughout all these spoof movies is is the Waynes brothers, usually Marlon and Sean Waynes. Uh, but I guess in this one, not even Sean wanted to do this movie. He was he he was smart and decided, no, 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 I ain't doing this one because this one spoofs not just one movie. We we were expected it just to spoof Fifty Shades of Grey, which is also why spoof a movie that's also shit. <laughs> it, 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 it's it already a joke. Fine. Yeah, yeah it, it's already a joke, and yet you're gonna spoof a. You can't spoof shit on top of shit. It's just more shit. But um, Marlon Wayans is the lead. He plays Christian Black, uh, and oh my god, lit, you know a movie's bad within the first five minutes. Brian and I both go, oh my god. <laughs> he just and 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 the reason why Brian, why why did we both go, oh my god, right in the first five minutes? Remember? I honestly don't. I block, I'm trying to remember. It's, it's, me. it's the horrific acting of the roommate. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. The roommate uh, who is, um, what the hell is her name? Jenny Zagrino. She plays Katisha. And literally the first sentence out of her mouth, Brian and I both just dropped our heads and went, why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we make ourselves watch these movies every week? Right. She's, she's, like, she's like the main the main female lead. She's like her roommate, and she's basically you know, one of these white girls who like think she's black and everything. And we're like, and every time she opened her mouth, she just kept on going. It was just the stupidest jokes in the world. Ironically, though, halfway through the movie, she was far from the worst thing about this movie. Well, the problem but is, is saying, got, in the first five minutes, where it's like, oh god. Well, the problem is, you got so numb to the shittiness of her acting and her dialogue. That everything else around it just stood out more. Yeah, so he was just, just drowned her out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just drowned her out because we was like, I can't listen to this character anymore. Uh, 
but yeah, I mean, it, Fifty Shades of Black is doesn't just spoof Fifty Shades of Grey. There's a horrifically awful Whiplash uh, spoof where we literally went, "What are they spoofing here?" And then as soon as we both go, "Oh my god!" And it is awful. Uh, they spoof um, Wedding Crashers at one point, which is another another horrible scene. Uh, and then they spoof Magic Mike, which I actually thought the Magic Mike one was actually funny until they went too far, which is the whole problem with this movie. They don't know when to keep it subtle, or, or they just go to, to an 11 the entire damn time. The acting is god-awful. No one's good in this, not even Marlon Wayans, who I actually like um, in, in a lot of the stuff. Even the spoof movies, uh, he's great, but there's, there's nothing funny about this movie. It's incredibly offensive, and it is really hard to offend me when watching a movie. And I was offended. I was offended for so many people while watching this film. I was, I was literally ashamed of Marlon Wayans and what he did in this movie and what he thought was okay to do in this movie. Uh, and I want to know what, what bills James Seymour and Fred Ward had to pay that they had to do this movie. <laughs> Fred, Fred Willard. Fred Willard. Um, Fred Willard. Fred Willard. <laughs> he literally just sits in a chair for one scene. And he got paid to do that. I mean, good for you, Fred. Um, the late Fred Willard. And Jane Seymour, yeah, who do you owe money to? Or how much money do you need to come on and just spout racist line after racist line after racist line? We're just like, oh, my God, we get it. Stop. Just stop. And then, and that, I mean, and, and the one thing that really pissed Brian and I off, I mean, there's a lot of things that piss us off about this movie. The inconsistency of the jokes Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, like at one point they, they, they set up a joke for, for, uh, we're, we're going to spoil it. We don't care. He, he spanks, he spanks, uh, the girl. Um, what's her name in this? It's Hannah Steele. Yeah. They, she spanked, he spanks her once in the movie. And she's like, Ooh, like you would. And then they go into a whole nother scene where her ass is so numb. He is breaking stuff and she never feels it. And then like 10 minutes later, he spanks her at, like, another day and she feels that we're like what she can feel stuff now what is this and it's just we get it it's a spoof movie and everything like there's a, there's a whole big you know elongated joke about her having yeah. an outie belly button and next scene no nope, it's not there it's just a regular any belly button yeah it's gone i mean they make the outie look like a small little penis you know, i know in these spoof movies sometimes things pop up in one scene but it's just like it's just it's just so constant through this whole thing when it literally takes over the entire scene that 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 one joke you got to kind of have that, keep that joke going. And they just completely just abandoned it. It's like, what the, hell? like literally the next time we saw her without a shirt on, we're like, where'd her, where's her Audi? <laughs> and, and that's the thing is like in a spoof movie, you shouldn't get the audience to start going, wait, what happened? To, why is she all of a sudden can feel Spanx now? Where'd her Audi go? We shouldn't that's have. That's how the movie we were. We were looking for things like that. But literally this was, this was the reactions that we were getting from the movie. It, the moments that we did laugh, was because we were looking at each other, just getting progressively, progressively more depressed. I watched as Sean slowly went off screen as he sunk farther and farther. I, by the end of the movie, I was like a five-year-old kid who was leaning towards our us without getting a toy because I just progressively just started slinking and pouting because I was just so over this because it's my reaction was more like, well, how many times did I ask you to do a time check? See how much we had left. Yes, you kept yes, you kept going how much time we got left. And I was like, well, if we're if we're doing 50 shades, I know that there's probably about 30, 40 minutes of story left. <laughs> and we kept doing time checks because we within the first five minutes we we're like, oh you know, no. I wanna I want to just that you see I, I think I saw 50 shades, but I don't even remember anything about it. So I must have paid not paid attention if I saw it. But you knew it you at least remembered it pretty well that you could tell I, how much last year, in Last year, I had to watch Fifty Shades study for a match. Okay, so and so you never, so you know, it never came up in the match. Which pissed me off. Part of the problem with the whole concept of this movie is that, first of all, to really I think get a lot of the jokes or appreciate a lot of the jokes, you have to have seen the original Fifty Shades of Grey. And I don't know how much overlap there is in the audience between Fifty Shades of Grey and this wild Marlon Wayans spoof movie. From, so from right there is part of the problem. From, from what I can remember from Fifty Shades, which I studied it, which you know I go through a movie with like fine tooth comb. I wish I didn't have to do that with 50 shades, but I did. There's only really one, I think one actual scene that they actually took out of and didn't put in 50 shades of black. Cause I was like, Oh, well they still got to do this. And they didn't do it. Uh, I think, I think they threw the magic Mike in scene instead. I think that's honestly what they did is they brought the magic Mike spoof scene in. 
um, instead of doing that because it it's it, it was even pointless to do it in Fifty Shades of Grey. But that's my point the point is, is that fully, go ahead. So I appreciate this to, uh, and appreciate this movie, but to really appreciate this movie or most movies, you have to have, like be familiar with the source material. And I like I said, I think there's very little overlap in the audiences. I don't think there's a lot of people that saw Fifty Shades that were going to see this. Like you wouldn't have seen Fifty Shades if you had never had to watch it for that. No, if I if I didn't have to study it for a trivia match, I never would have watched Fifty Shades. Fifty Shades is more the kind of movie that is a scene, a brief scene in another spoof movie. Kind of like right. what they did with Whiplash here is what another better spoof movie would do with Fifty Shades. Absolutely, it would not be a whole movie. About it was a scene in a spoof movie, and not a whole yeah. movie. And that's the other thing with spoofs. When you spoof movies. You're supposed to spoof movies that people like. Spaceballs spoofs Star Wars because people love Star Wars. Not another team movie spoofed Varsity Blues, which we talked about on the show. Another movie that we're literally going to be talking about here very, very shortly. Uh, Can't really wait. All the John Hughes movies, all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, Spoofing stuff that people are fans of, and that's the whole part of the joke. <coughs> Hot Shots spoofs Top Gun. No one outside of people with i'm sorry i don't care if i piss off incredibly bad taste uh like 50 shades of gray or people who really really love the book love the movie okay basically moms i'm sorry uh or people who really really just like bdsm but that does not make like i'm sorry the movies the the, the 50 shades of gray movies are critically butchered and ripped apart about how bad they are so why would you make a spoof on top of it? Because no one wants if no one wants to see those movies outside of a certain sex, um, which nothing wrong with that. I mean, we have our guy movies that are like that the same, but and they're probably just as bad, but we just don't see it. But it's they gotta be good. They gotta be good movies to at least get good jokes. And when literally the spoof movie is making fun of the actual film. And not in a spoof way, but literally talking shit about the movie it's spoofing. I do, there, are, yes. there are two separate jokes in this movie where they are verbal. Most spoof like, movies are almost kind of an homage to them. Like, yeah. like you know, Hot Shots, it's mocking Top Gun, but it's like, you know, because Top Gun was a movie. Yeah, it's out of respect and love for that. But they're still going, wow, Fifty Shades sucked. It was like, yeah, this, with this movie, they're usually, they're, they're actually using Fifty Shades of Grey as a torture device by making the, the uh, Christian's character read the book to the girl and her going, no, I can't take anymore. And it's like, oh, it's, I hate that we spent so much, so much time talking about it, but literally Come this movie is hands down. When we, like we, we've gone and through these weeks and we're like, here's a stinker. It's not the worst movie, but it was of the week. No, this, this is garbage. This is and, and now this is a movie we knew going in. Now don't, don't, we absolutely. Oh, here's the thing, here's the thing. You and I put it on the stinker thing, and we had never seen it. We were just like, this is probably the stinker. And and for a brief moment, we were like, what if we end up liking this movie? And then five minutes in, we're like, oh, no. Because I have been known, like, even a lot of the spoof movies, not all of them, but there, there are some spoof movies that people don't like that I think, you know, I actually thought, you know, it was amusing. It had some funny parts in it. So, I, yeah, the same thing could have happened here, but it did not. No, it never got better. It never I may I may have laughed two, maybe three times. And even, and even the laugh was like a... It wasn't like a. <laughs> you know what? We, we, we actually. I remember we made a comment that um, at one point you said, "Okay, that was funny." And when you're actually noticing, like, "Oh, something's actually funny," then your comedy isn't good. Yeah, no. It was, it was, and I, I remember exactly the moment. It was. It was the Magic Mike scene. What he does this one thing, and I went, "Okay, that's actually good." And it's like when I have to point out, "Okay, that's actually good." That means it's bad. Okay, an hour and twelve minutes in the movie, there's something funny. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, yeah, that was about an hour, 20 minutes into the movie, too. Yeah. Anyway, don't watch this. Don't watch this. I don't want my worst enemies that are out there to watch this. You don't deserve to have to put yourself through the pain that Brian and I put ourselves through for an hour and 40-plus minutes. It is on HBO Max. Don't watch it. Don't don't watch it. I would watch 50 Shades of Grey on loop for an entire weekend before I would watch Five more minutes of this crap. I would watch Paul Blart for a whole week before I would watch this movie again. Leprechaun. I would watch all of our sneakers so far and all of our sneakers for the rest of the year. I'm not going to say rest of the year yet. But no, 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 no. <laughs> There's one. I, will watch I would rather watch this than that one. Just say it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so bad. It's so bad. Anyway, 
let's move on to something that we enjoyed for the most cool. part. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't don't watch Fifty Shades of Black, guys. I beg you, don't do it. If you guys are watching it, I mean, we're doing it for the show. But if you guys are watching that for for pure enjoyment, you're part of the right. problem. You're <laughs> part of the problem if you watch this movie. Uh, and luckily, our friends on Letterbox, they all seem to agree. <laughs> there, there, there were sixty four people who gave five stars, and that better have been a joke. I'm telling you that right now. It really better been. Yeah. There are sixty four people on Letterbox who gave this five out of five. That better be a joke. I don't want to meet those people because, oh, my God. Anyway, we're going to go to our feature film now. Uh, and our feature film is a film that literally sparked a trend that is still going on to this day. Of course, it is Liam Neeson's Taken. Uh, Liam Neeson's Taken came out. I don't know why I'm putting Liam Neeson's name in front of the title. Like, it's Bram Stoker's Dracula. But anyway, Taken came out on January 30th, 2009, had a budget – of 25 million had a weekend opening of 24.7 million and it was number one on its opening weekend and its only week at number one finished the box office at a 226.8 million uh, 145 domestic and 81.8 million international uh you know what brian take it away uh yeah well like, i mean everybody knows taken by now but um at, at the time liam neeson had been in action movies previously he had done dark man he'd done things like this but he kind of got into this part of his career where you know except for like showing up with qui-gon jan and star wars he was doing dramas yeah, and, things like that. and stuff like that and then we're like okay this movie's gonna have uh liam neeson in in basically an action i know you've all seen the trailer you know his his daughter gets kidnapped and it's, you know he's got makes a phone call i have a particular set of skills i will find you i will kill you I don't need to uh, yeah. cover all that because you all. That's what sold, sold the movie too. It wasn't the totally whole, sold the movie. You watch the trailer. The trailer itself is whatever, but it's that it's that scene that that's sold finished. the entire movie. Yeah, yeah, you see that and you're like, wow, this 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 Liam Neeson. And then you went and saw the movie, and it had Liam Neeson kicking ass up and down all over the place. Now now the movie a series is um it totally delivered, but like we talked about, it started a whole sub subgenre. Of well, not not only Liam Neeson. But, yeah, go ahead. No, it's like, it's like it didn't just start a subgenre. It started a genre of Liam Neeson action payback movies. It's, a subgenre of actors who are not quite cutting it anymore in a lot of other movies. So like, let's put them in a movie like this to kind of boost them back up. Especially John, like aging actors. I mean, I Liam Neeson's done this. He's done nonstop. He's done Walking uh, Tombstones, Muter, uh, Walking Tombstones, Run All Night. Chickens. Uh, the Marksman just came out. I was here last year. Cold Pursuit. Cold. Oh my gosh, the, the Snowplow movie. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the Honest Thief just came out. That's the Honest Thief was one of those. Yeah. There's like 20 plus so, movies. He's done all those. And then you have, you know, um, they they put uh, Kevin Costner in Three Days to Kill. They put Sean Penn in The Gunman. You know, all these kind of agent. They thought, oh, this uh, agent guys. Jet, and Jet Li. Jet Li. Uh, what's, it's not the Postman. I mean, not Jet Li. Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan, the Foreigner. The Foreigner. Um, Which actually uh, Jackie Chan's barely in, by the way. So don't get me started on The Foreigner. Uh, Peppermint. Peppermint with Jennifer Gardner. Uh, yeah. Bob Odenkirk now with Nobody. And oh, that I'm one. Sorry, no, no, I'm, well, I'm excited for that one. I'm excited yeah. for that. I've been anticipating because I love Bob Anyway, Odenkirk. so it started this, it's kind of started this whole way. thing yeah. where it's almost kind of – and they've, been, they've not been very good in the last few years. But this one, the first – even its own sequels were gradually inferior. And the third one is just horrible. But this first one was actually a very, very good movie. I mean, both in the story and the action sequences, especially. Now, when I rewatched it now, I was not nearly as impressed. But I think part of that is because it's been redone and copied so many times over and over and over again. But, I mean, Liam Neeson kind of showed everybody he could be a badass. He was kicking ass. Um, Maggie Grace is the daughter. Oh, God. Now, now so, I love okay. Maggie Grace. I've yeah, loved her since Lost. like we like Maggie Grace. We I've do. seen her in other movies where I really like her. I didn't remember hating her in this movie, and I don't hate her now. But she, somehow it's I like now I look at it and realize, okay, she was like 24 when she filmed this, and she's supposed to be a 17 year old, which is I, not unheard of. So I messaged you because I watched okay. I messaged you, and I go, why is Maggie Grace? Granted, I thought she was – because I went by the time the movie came out, not by when it was shot. I said she was 27. Yo, know, why is Maggie Grace, who's 27, portraying a girl who just turned 17, acting like a 13-year-old? Because it's creepy. It's weird. <laughs> it's so weird when she runs up, Daddy, 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 you're 17. You're, no, you're 27 or 24. You're 24 acting 
brand new 17, acting like a 13 year older. It was creepy. So was when like, I watched this, like the day after I talked to him, I kind of saw it. I was kind of looking for that. And I totally saw it. It's like, it's like she, like, I don't know if she just doesn't remember being 17, but she was totally playing it more like a 13 year old. That's what it was, 17, she was, I think she was doing Lost. And it was kind of, it was just, it was, it was kind of silly. Now, granted, there's only a couple, it's only like a scene or two of that, but it's, it is, it is a little funny. And, and the rest of the week, she's kind of playing when she shows up, she's kind of drugged and stuff. So yeah. it's, it's not a factor. But I like Maggie Grace, but she was a little little silly in those roles. Um, the rest of the supporting cast, you know, you had Famke Jansen as the, I guess, ex-wife. Um, Xander Berkeley, good character actor. He was kind of the stepdad. Uh, mm -hmm. Leland Orser, who uh, I know from Very Bad Things. I know from uh, I know from Seven, ER. a few ER. other things. What do you know from? ER. ER. Oh, I forgot he was on ER. Yeah, oh, yeah he's he's not, he's not, he's in a very small supporting role. But I mean, but really, it's it's the it's kind of the action that carries this. And and if you look back at it now, if somebody saw it for the first time now, they'd be like, eh, another yeah. Liam Neeson action movie. But really, at the time, this was kind of a, you know a big breakthrough. And and you know what? I will give Taken this. Yes, Taken gave us twenty movies of this genre, the revenge older person genre thing. But I will say this: if it had not been for Taken. I do not think we would have gotten John Wick. That's quite possible. I think because once again, taking an actor who's kind of middling in their career, kind of stuck, and you put him in an action revenge movie, Liam Neeson perfected it in in this, and then they gave it one to John Wick, and then John Wick turned it into its own. You thing. know, I don't even know that. I don't even. I'm not like I'm not saying that we think this movie inspired that, but I think Taken showed them that it can be marketable. It can work. I think because people think action movies, they want young actors, you know, go out and do the action. But I think this is the one that showed studios like, well, wait, hang on a second. We can make some money off of older actors, you know, doing action scenes. If they, they, can, train, action. they can train in some fighting and yeah. just make them act rougher and, and angry and they can, it can work. I mean, it works with Bruce Willis, work with Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger. Why not work with these other actors who are out there that are cheaper at the time? Because I'm sure Liam Neeson now – through the roof in terms of, but back then probably a little bit cheaper. Yeah, I th but uh, I think this showed that they could be marketable and it worked. Exactly, and like I said, I and I think that's I think that is what kind of gave John Wick. They they're like, let's we want we, we like Keanu Reeves. Let's get Keanu Reeves something. Well, how about Taken? Okay, but let's do this with it. And they kind of went and they went in their own path and it works. And now people are starting to copy John Wick. But I literally when I when John Wick first came out, I was like, oh, it's Keanu Reeves doing Taken. That's just it for the longest time now. Whenever you see like a, kind of an older actor in a like as a solo, you know, yeah, uh, action guy, you think, oh, this is that person's taken. Just That's like it used exactly. to be. Like, it used to be like you know, Die Hard on a on a plane, Die Hard on a boat, Die Hard in this. Now it's like, oh, this is this person's taken. This person's yeah, taken. Absolutely. So this was the first one. I mean, well, let's put it this way: it's not like there wasn't any movies like this prior to that, but this was the first one that I think really exploded in terms of box office success and spawned all this stuff. Because once this happened, like I said, it started the trend. Uh, this is also one of a few movies that I think really started breaking open like early year box office. Because it used to be a wasteland until you hit, you know, maybe March, April. And that's um, what you do is I think Taken was more or less like a, let's just throw it out in January because we have no idea if this is going to be good. Because I don't think they trusted it. I think, that, I think they thought they were just throwing it away. And then yeah. it took up. Which is why every January... That's when Liam Neeson comes out with his movies. It is. His window. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 that January February window. That's when he comes out with his film. So you can guarantee that pretty much every January February Liam Neeson's coming out with one of these movies. Uh, and you know what? Like I said, it works for him. Do I watch all of them? No. Do I like seventy four percent of them? Not really. But it works. Tyler Perry's got the Medeas. John Wick with Keanu Reeves. Um, you got all these people who have their stick. Adam Sandler with his goofy ass Netflix films. This is Liam Neeson's thing, and he'll do it until he can't do it anymore. And good for you, Liam Neeson, because honestly, this movie re revitalized your career, made you an action star when no one, even though you were Qui Gon Jinn, I don't think anyone ever actually looked at him as an action star prior to this. No. Uh, but yeah, good for him on that. But uh, I just noticed, I noticed the uh, the director yeah. is Pierre Morel. He was um, actually produced by Luc Besson. But it was directed by Pierre Morel, who it turns out also directed Peppermint. He also directed The Gunman. <laughs> um, but he also directed a, a movie I would actually recommend people see if you like action. Um, it's a movie called District B13. 
it's I believe a French film. It's essentially parkour action movie, and it's it was remade for America as Brick Mansions, which was, eh. But okay. if you like action, check out District B thirteen. It's fine. It's kind of Escape from New York with parkour. <laughs> yeah, well, that's both on it because he's, I've been waiting for a re- revitalized Escape from L A. Escape from New York kind of thing. So if you can give me some, do you ever stop and think what that means is more parkour? I'm sure I'm back then, probably not because parkour wasn't a thing. But right. by today's standards, yes, it would probably need some more parkour. Um, <laughs> Taken is it? Uh, I, I remember I watched it on my. I watched it because I had the disc. Is it's it on- not on your free streaming services. You can rent it everywhere, but right, yeah, it's so- currently not available free streaming. Gotcha. Uh, so that's our feature film of the week. Next, we're going to go to our revisited. Uh, we, I think, we literally were battling on our revisited pretty much all the way up to the final moments. Going, okay, we need to watch one. Um, and we went with the. I remember last week we told you we were going to go with either a action film with a great villain performance that probably not enough people have seen, or we were going to go with the teenage uh, classic. And we buckled and we went with the teenage classic. And that is 1999's She's All That. Well, tell them what the other one was. Tell them go see the other, it. The other one, if you guys have not seen it, well, I, I wasn't going to say because we might use it next year. But, oh, okay, never mind. Uh, that people aren't going to remember. But it was, it was going to, if you guys have not seen it, uh, Desperate Measures with Andy Garcia and Michael Keaton. Um, Michael Keaton's the villain in well, it. Michael Keaton is always a good thing. Well, this was, I, I, outside of, I don't know, can you remember another villain role before this for him? Was he for a villain? Him? Uh, yeah. Pacific Heights is the one that jumps to mind. Okay, so he did do one before this. He, he did one here and there, but not very often. Yeah, and it basically, the, the premise of that is he's like this. Uh, was he? Isn't he like a murderer on death row, and he has to get surgery done? In the hospital? It's, it's something about like the. I, I, it's been a while since I've yeah, seen like, it. Like, like, someone else needs world. like a transplant or something, and he's yeah. the one donor who matches. But it's the cop who caught him is the one whose daughter needs it, or something like that. Yeah, and then he takes he takes over the hospital, and then it's basically Andy Garcia die hard in a hospital. But with but with Michael Keaton as the Hans Gruber, except that he's American. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it Desperate Measures is good. But yeah, we're not talking about that. We're talking about She's All That. Everyone's like, you bastards, because <laughs> we got them excited for that movie. And we're gonna talk about a teen movie. Um, She's maybe All next That. Year. <laughs> yes, maybe next year. Uh, She's All That came out January 29th, nineteen ninety nine. Had a budget of ten million dollars. Had an opening weekend of sixteen million. Was also number one. Its opening weekend, only one week uh, at number one, and finished with a box office of one hundred and three point one six million, sixty three point three six million domestic, and thirty nine point eight internationally. Now, this movie, um, I remember when it first came out. Now, naturally, I was a young teenager when this first came out, so I did not want to watch this. I hated this movie, but I was also the youngest. Uh, of of my cho- of, of my children of my family I was the youngest of my family and my older sister she's two years older than me uh, was this was the perfect age for her to watch this movie and when this movie came out on VHS I swear to God she watched this every day for a month and I being the youngest had no control over the TV so every day after school I would come home. And either Backstreet Boys was playing on the radio or She's All That was on the TV. And I just had to sit there and deal with it. So kind of like uh, uh, what's uh, what's the syndrome called when you get kidnapped and you start to like fall for the kidnapper? Um, uh, I'm blanking out. Uh, I'm blanking on it. You, everyone who's watching. You know, you. Yes, that. Um, yeah, I learned to love this movie. <laughs> Because of it, um, so yeah, she, we went, we went with she's all that because as soon as it popped up, I was like, "Ooh, she's all that!" And in my head, I'm going, "Why did you go ooh?" Because it's been implanted in my brain for watching it every single day for a solid month. Brian, take it away. She's all that. All right. Well, she's all that. See, this movie came out. I I should have seen and loved this movie because in that late '90s window where like kind of all these teen comedies come out, you know, I was actually in my twenties, but I was kind of, this is kind of the movie, what, you know, I loved. I mean, this is kind of around the same time as uh, can't buy me love. And, you know, we talk about varsity blues and some of these other things. And, um, but somehow I never saw this movie. Now I, apparently I haven't logged that. I watched it last year on TV. I must just had it on the background cause I didn't remember any of it. So I, but I watched it for this. Um, it's essentially the, 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 uh, you know, uh, Pygmalion, My Fair Lady. It's the same story. It's been done many, many times. It's kind of the updated teen version of that. Um, but 
<sighs> my biggest problem watching this movie is the fact that I've seen not another teen movie so many times, including very recently. And every scene I watched in this movie, because it's you know, a lot of it is used in not another teen movie. I'm 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 just comparing it to the scene in that. Like every time Dule Hill showed up in this movie, I was waiting for him to be like, "That is whack." But literally every time he's on screen, just waiting for him to say it. Um, it's not a bad movie. It's it is what it is. It's a teen comedy. It's not one that I would put as like you know one of one of, the, uh, one of my favorite ones. Um, but not even close to kind of on that list. But I mean, I, I love Rachel Lee Cook in anything she yeah. does. Even in a bad movie, I'll watch Rachel Lee Cook. She's just adorable. Um, Freddie Prinze and Matthew Lillard, you know what you're getting with those two. This started, honestly, this started the bromance. This was their first <laughs> This yeah. started the bromance, yes. For this anyone is, wants this, to know. pre Scooby Doo, pre all that, yeah. Actually, was this pre Wing Commander? Ah. Uh, wow, was Wing Commander 97? I don't know. I, I forget about it. I'm looking it up. Keep going. Keep, I'm looking keep, it up. Keep it. But I mean, it's, it's, you got Kieran Culkin in it. You got Paul Walker in it. You got uh, Gabrielle Unions in it. Clea Duvall. Anna Paquin, who I forgot was in this. Yeah. Uh, she's a little sister. You got Kevin Pollack, who I always love, although he just plays a very small part as her father. No, but he's good in the parts that he's in. Yeah, but uh, Wing, Commander uh, Wing Commander was the next one for them after this. Uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar shows up for about half a second. Like six seconds. No, no lines in the movie. She's just there. <laughs> right. Um, um, but but I mean, it's so I mean, it's got a good cast. It's got a it's got a good cast. Um, like I said, it's based on a classic story. It's kind of updated version of it. Um, it's it's an enjoyable time waster for you know an hour and a half, however long it is. Um, so I don't love it, but didn't hate it. Yeah, it, it's and like I said, I, I'm pretty much on par with you. I will watch Rachel Lee Cook in anything. I even watched her in uh, Love Guaranteed last year on Netflix because she's in that, and it's got Damon Wayans Jr., who I also love. Um, Paul also, Walker, she's in this with Julia Hill, and she's uh, had a part on Psych for a while. Yes, and I, I, I was going to get to that. Oh. Julia Hill uh, is on Psych, which is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Rachel Lee Cook pops up on that for. A few, uh, I'd say about a good five, ten episodes, which she's adorable in that. She's adorable in everything. Uh, which it may be sad watching Julie Hill just be like, get like a little line here, a little line here. <laughs> and it's like, oh, dude, I love Damn, you. Shit. Like, that yeah, is whack. Come on, guy. You can't do that. That's not cool. I don't want to be the voice of reason here. I'm staying out of this. That's literally his entire like quotes throughout the entire meal. Gabrielle Union, I think this was right before Bring It Bring It On as well. So this was like before, like one of her first. Same year, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, it was the year before. It was the year before. It was the year before. Yeah, because uh, – and then you got Paul Walker, which is weird because – wasn't Varsity Blues also 99? Yes. So Varsity Blues came out two weeks prior to this, or was it last week? Was it last week? We just uh, did the shows, and we can't remember our own shows. It, it, was a week two, it was a week or two at last week, but yet Paul Walker looks so much older in Varsity Blues compared to She's All That because he – it's just – and you can tell, like – I don't know. Like he doesn't get a whole lot of lines in Varsity Blues, but he's definitely a better actor in Varsity Blues than he is in She's All That. Freddie Prince, he's still kind of, I, I, it, it, it's, it's messing with my whole timeline. Cause I thought She's All That was a like kind of their first films, and then he did. Uh, I know she did it last summer after this, but he actually did that two years prior, and he acts way better. <laughs> and I know she did last summer than he does in this. Um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a it's a harmless high school film. Uh, it's beloved by a lot of people that were teenagers around that time. Um, it made that one move, that one song, like number one. I think everyone listened to that damn song because of this movie. Um, I totally forgot about the dance sequence number at the, oh, um, oh which is so bad. It's so bad. It's, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of become a thing about these these teen comedies, which at their proms or whatever it is, their homecoming dances, they have yeah. this. Automatically, like this whole choreographed dance where all the uh, everyone, all the students apparently know the exact, you know, yeah, choreography. They wanted, a, they wanted a grease moment in the movie. That's basically what they want. They wanted a grease moment. Yeah, so it, it's 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 quite silly, but you know that's why actually quite kind of why I would recommend. I would watch this and not another teen movie back to back. Although, make sure you watch this first. Well, so, well, no, no, this Varsity Blues, then not because. Yeah. So Do a triple movie, feature, basically. and you will have the time of your life because yeah, it's because another team movie is basically she's all that and Varsity Blues spooky. Oh, can't hardly wait. Can watch four movies. Oh. Yeah, can't hardly wait. <laughs> no, like, no, the John Hughes movies. No, no, anyway. No, no, that's too far. But uh, but yeah, like I said, um, Matthew Lillard is basically being Matthew Lillard two and eleven. Which if He's you like, at, I don't know how many of you remember the real world. He was basically playing Puck, Puck in the real Puck. world. Puck. Which I'm oh my god, why do I know that? <laughs> why do I know that? Um, Usher 
if Usher's got a real small part, he's basically like the school radio DJ. DJ. Yeah. Did he ever go to class? I don't think I ever saw him outside of the DJ booth. Um, Kelly said Kevin Pollock solid in it. Karen Culkin plays the little brother. He saw it. Anna Paquin's good in it. Um, uh, oh, I always blank on his name. He was in last week's Butterfly Effect. Eldon. Eldon Henson. Eldon Henson. He's he's solid in it. Like I said the honestly the the, the weakest performances are Paul Walker and Freddie Prince Jr. and they're on camera quite a bit. But and um, even them, they're they're fine for this kind of movie. They play yeah, the role. It is. Yeah. They're, they're, you could tell that they're relatively new, yeah. even though they both did movies technically earlier than this that they were better in. But nonetheless, she's all that. Uh, I call it a teenage classic because when I was a kid, that movie or a teenager, that movie was talked about forever. And like I said, I got basically tortured into watching that every day for a month. So it is embedded in my brain. Um, but yes, uh, she's all that. I don't believe it's on any streaming services. If you have Showtime, it's on there. Otherwise, you got to pay for it somewhere. Exactly. Um, but yes, that was our revisited of the week. Uh, we are now going to Brian's pick. Uh, now, before Brian's pick, I had I had heard of this movie, and this is one of those movies that, like I heard it, I saw the trailer, and I was like, "Oh, that looks good," and then I never heard about it ever again, which made me weird when Brian's like that one. And I was like, "Wait, that came out." <laughs> and that is uh Eventually, and i'll get to that part yeah yes you'll get to that part i was I basically setting you up for it um but it is uh jane got a gun uh came out january 29th 2016 had a budget of 25 million and had a weekend opening of 835,500. i think it's the, i think that's the lowest opening we've had on the show um it was number 17 and i'm sorry i'm not naming off 16 other movies ahead of it that's just gonna be <laughs> Doing doing ten when they finished ten was too long. I'm not doing seventeen. Yeah. Uh, had a finished box office of three million, uh, one point five million domestic, and one point five five million international. Uh, Brian, take it away with Jane Got a Gun. Well, that's one of the reasons I want to talk about this movie is because nobody's seen it. Um, Jane Got a Gun. Uh, basically, Natalie Portman plays uh, a woman whose uh, husband uh, comes back and he's he's all shot up. Um, He's he's basically uh, had an encounter with uh, a group he used to work with, a group of bad guys, essentially. And he's all shot up and he comes back and she's trying to patch him up and he's basically incapacitated. But the problem is uh, the people who got him are going to be coming. They're coming looking for him. And uh, so she know, she's trying to prepare for their return. Uh, she goes and enlists the help of uh, another character played by Joel Edgerton, who was uh, like an ex-boyfriend lover of hers. Um, who essentially had gone off to war. Um, but by the time he came back, because she didn't know if she, he was dead or what, she thought he was dead. She had remarried this other guy. He came back. She's married. So they don't have a good relationship. He kind of lives, you know, a ways away. She goes and lists his help to come and help prepare and help her uh, basically as a hired gun um, to defend when these people come back looking for her husband. That's the basic plot of the movie. Um, the performance is in it great i think i think uh natalie portman who also produced this movie i think uh, first of all she looks great in a cowboy outfit yes, she <laughs> but you yeah, know natalie portman's adorable i'll watch natalie portman in anything yeah but i think i think she does a really good performance here joel edgerton's in it um ewan mcgregor plays the villain he hams it up a little too much he only, gets like, he only gets like two three scenes that's not really his fault yeah he does. Um, Boyd Holbrook, um, who you might know from movies like uh, he was in Logan. He was in uh, The Predator, uh, the most recent Predator. Um, yeah. I know he's done other stuff. Just leave my mind. Those are the two movies I have on top of my Those head. Those are two. Uh, Rodrigo Santoro also, who played uh, King Xerxes in 300. Yeah. Um, he's also in Lost and some other things. And Love Actually. Oh, Love Actually. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's got a, it's got a good cast. Um, first of all, give me your thoughts on it. Oh, Noah know. Emmerich. Don't forget Noah Emmerich. Oh, no, Emmerich's the husband. He's basically yeah, plays the movie laying in bed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, you made me watch this, and and you kind of pre-warned me. Um, and you haven't really gotten into the, the main reasons with why the film is the way it is. But let me get my stuff out of the way, and I'll just let you go on your mm -hmm. question about it. Um, yeah, it's 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 an hour and a half. It's relatively quick. Um, but it's got about, a, like you said, about a good slow 20 minutes to start. Um, my main problem with it, and like I said, I, I agree. The performances are all good. I don't hate any of the performances. The main problem is that the it's all set up. The movie's just all set up. It, it's not 
anything that has any remnants of a story, I felt they told in quick flashbacks to kind of just speed up the That's story. That's why I will agree. Because, I, I mean, we the story isn't bad, although you said there's not much to it. Um, yeah. The cinematography is beautiful, which in a lot of Westerns it is. Just yeah, most of them. It's very hard to make a bad-looking um, Western. So. I, I, th I, I think a lot of the problem was in the editing of the movie. And that's because so much of it is like told in flashback, and then you feel like you're missing parts of the story, which I, it didn't bother me as much as it did you. But editing is one thing that I noticed. Well, in this. The, the the main problem is just because it's like, okay, what happened with these characters? It, it, but the problem is like sometimes it takes over an hour to figure out why these characters are where they're at now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you just, usually you don't want to wait over an hour into a movie to finally get that information. Well, and sometimes it's the point of the movie. It's the mystery. Like, oh, how did they get to this point? But here it's, it's, it's not, there's no reason to hold off that payoff to that. No, because you're just waiting and you're waiting and you finally get the mission. Like, okay, that information would have helped with the character development 30 minutes ago. Right. Um, but then the other thing too, is that when you finally get to the big action sequence at the end, it's all sh not shown. Everything is like, they're, they're all hunkered down in the house, and they're being shot at, and they're doing shooting outside, but they don't really show anything. You're just hearing everything happen, and then, boom, the movie's over. And it's just like, did you not have the – I mean, the budget's – what was it, 25 mil? Um, I think I said 25 million. Uh, but it's, it's just one of those things where it's like – it's a Western. We're supposed to see shoot 'em ups and all this, and we're seeing them shoot – but we're not really seeing the end effect of the shots, you know? And then, like, it's it's really dark as well. Like, I actually had a hard time watching it because it was just really dark on my laptop. The, the, the last the last act is dark. It's, yeah. it's so dark. Like, certain things were happening. And I was like, wait, when did that happen? I didn't see it. And it's not because I wasn't paying attention. It's because I couldn't see it. Um, but, yeah, it's just there's, there's a lot of story missing. It, this is one of those movies where we've talked about how movies go way too long. This movie needed. 30 more minutes to make Ewan McGregor's character of stronger villain. They, they, more minutes the end, they needed to fill us in the middle. Yeah. It's like they, we needed more of the middle to, to build all these characters up. Cause outside of just like little five minutes here for Ewan McGregor, there was nothing for his character to go off of, except for they want to kill Natalie Portman's husband. That's the only information we have. That's the only information we really get outside of the, the flashback story we get for, five minutes right at before the final act starts. Um, but that was the main thing. It's like, I didn't hate it. I could just see why it wasn't critically uh, enjoyed by a lot of people. Cause it's like I say, it's all set up. A lot of the story is, is done in pieces and not in the right pieces and the action, which is what you're building up to. You're building up to this big action set piece. sequence, kind of like almost like a magnificent seven type action sequence. And then it just doesn't, deliver but the performances are good i will give you the performances like they are all really solid in the film you know so i, I like the movie a lot more than he did I, I i don't you know it's not a five-star movie or anything but i enjoyed it a lot more than than sean did um but a part of that i think was because just uh, natalie portman heading up a western i thought was a great idea the concept to start with and part of the problem with this movie is that it i was following the story waiting for this movie to come out because i heard about it. hey it's natalie portman western and it had the weirdest history now, listen, so when, it, when they first started making the movie, Natalie Portman was, of course, in the same role. Um, Michael Fassbender was the role of her, uh, the, the boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend who's going to come help her. And uh, Joel Edgerton was the villain. His name is John Bishop. Uh, Michael Fassbender had to drop out. So they brought in um, Jude, Law. Jude Law. Jude Law was going to come in and play, except Jude Law was going to, come in and play that role. But then the director, Lynn Ramsey, who had done uh, independent films like, we have to talk about Kevin, a few other things. First day of filming, she quit. She didn't show up. So that's part of the reason the budget, because they had all this ramp up. They had to stop it cold and basically start over. She quit, didn't show up. Nobody even knew why. They later found out that she just decided to quit. Um, Jude Law left because he only signed up because he wanted to work with that director. So they bring in Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper eventually has to quit to go make American Hustle. They bring in Ewan McGregor. And in the meantime, Joel Edgerton moved from the villain role to good guy role. And it's just this whole big weird thing of how it got made. And then the fact that it was supposed to be produced by the Weinsteins. We know what happened with Harvey Weinstein. So this is one of those movies that got caught in limbo. Um, it got shelved for the longest time. When it finally got you know released so a different company could release it, it clearly got dumped in January in very few theaters and very little fanfare. And so that's part of the reason it didn't do so well. But... So anyway, all that's just to say, there's a reason why a lot of people haven't seen this movie. I think it's worth watching. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those. It, it, it's one of those movies that just like 
could if if had all that stuff not had happened, could this movie have actually ended up being a really solid film? Which I mean, you think it's a solid film regardless, but I'm talking about for me without all that extra stuff because like that when you're telling me about this cast, I was like, ooh, I like that, I like that. Like yeah, and then they right. left, and this oh, I like that too. But then they left, and, then, and I was like, and honestly, I don't hate you. I love you. We, we love you, and McGregor. This is I think the third or fourth time he's popped up on the show so far. Third time in four episodes. I, you and McGregor. I also love, one of the things I love about this movie is, is the little mini Star Wars reunion. He's got Natalie Portman, you got Joel Edgerton, you got Ewan McGregor. Yeah, you got Padme, Owen, and Obi-Wan, all in, but Western. Right. Uh, but yeah, could this movie have been better if it was just filmed from the start and they didn't have to stop and start? And they actually, when they changed uh, directors, I should say Gavin O'Connor, um, the director of Warrior, uh, Joel Edgerton knew him, obviously. So he's oh, actually yeah. the one who convinced him to come uh, direct the movie and he helped rewrite it. Joel Edgerton did. So again, there's a whole big rehash had to be done probably because at that point they were slashing the budget. Yeah. And so what could, what, what could the movie have been? We don't know. That was the other thing too, that you told me that ahead of time. Like, oh, Gavin O'Connor did this guy from Warrior, which is one of my favorite sports films. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, this is going to be great. And then I was like, this doesn't feel like Warrior. Like, obviously it's not going to feel like Warrior. It's an MMA movie. But it's, it's kind of like, one of those things where he came into somebody else's movie though. And yeah, he's so always, it's like, how much, how much of it did he, was he able to shape? Exactly. I mean, and that's, that was the problem. So it's one of those movies that it could have had the potential of being something really, really good, but just had everything go against it. And because of it, we just got what we got, you know, and it sucks because obviously we love Natalie Portman and Ewan McGregor and Joel Edgerton and even Gavin O'Connor as a director. But it's just one of those movies that too many bad things happened. They just worked with what they had and it came out and it literally came out with a whimper. No one, no one went and saw it. Like didn't even crack a million It's dollars. one of those things that I'm pretty sure only got released to fulfill, to fulfill a contractual obligation. Because it seems like they just kind of dumped it in a few theaters for a couple of weeks, and then just as something before they put it out. It, on it. didn't stay out there very long. Like, yeah. It was in and out. Um, but yeah, uh, Jane got a gun. I don't believe it's on. Strangely, the only places you can even rent it are on Google Play and YouTube. Yeah, I had a hard time trying to find this so I could. <laughs> watched it for you i think i watched it because i didn't uh, buy it I, I i had the blu-ray so i also yeah, had it on my voodoo and stuff you so. had me you had me watch it off your your voodoo uh yeah. so that's how i got to see it um which if you hadn't i wouldn't have been able to watch it at least not legally anyway um but yes yeah, so uh jane got a gun uh good luck finding it that also doesn't make it any easier to really try to sell it on people so you can't find it really anywhere well, you can just youtube you gotta, or google play you gotta, you gotta look for it um, but yeah, uh, going to the final movie of the episode, it is my pick. Uh, like I said, uh, last week and at the beginning of the episode, this pick is, uh, very personal to me, uh, for, uh, one huge reason. And that is 2009's The Wrestler. Uh, The Wrestler, uh, came out January 30th, 2009, um, had a budget of $6 million, had a weekend opening of $2.3 it had made 10.7 million in limited releases and was number 16 in its opening weekend. Uh, finished its box office at 44.7 million, 26.2 million domestic, and 18.49 million internationally. Uh, Oscar film. Um, it's it's the movie that everyone talks about that reutilized uh, Mickey Rourke's career. Uh, I think Sin City personally did that, um, but that was like five years earlier. Uh, this movie, uh, for many people who know me and for the people that don't, I was a professional wrestler for, uh, 14 years and this movie, now I am, I, I am very, very, very hard on, on wrestling films. Um, I judge them very, very harshly, especially if they treat them with disrespect or like a joke or anything like that. Um, Ready to Rumble, I'm actually okay with because they – it's about two fans who love the sport of wrestling, who believe it's real, uh, and they treat it – and they treat the story like it's real in a sense. And I actually don't mind that even a lot of people hate that movie. Nacho Libre is garbage. That movie makes fun of professional wrestling, and I hate that movie because of it. Uh, and I was so excited to see a Jack Black pro wrestling movie because I thought it was going to be great. And then halfway through the film, I was like, this is just making fun of pro wrestling. Um, so – when the wrestler, when I saw the first trailer for this film, um, I was just over the moon excited for this, but I was incredibly worried about how they were going to handle it. And I was blown away with the way they treated uh, professional wrestling with the utmost respect because they could have done um, the whole flash and glamour of like, 
working for the WWE, kind of like what they did with Fighting With My Family, which that's a whole other movie I have an issue with, um, where uh, basically they're telling, you know, oh, being in the WWE, here's all the, you know, trying to work up to the main roster, stuff like that. This is about the story of uh, effectively, I would say, like a Hulk Hogan type of character. Um, he's he's in his uh, 50s. He's run down, still in great shape, but that's because he takes uh, basically drugs and steroids to stay in shape. He's battered down. He's beaten. And now he's working on the independent circuit, which is where I wrestled, uh, where you're basically wrestling with for whoever would have you. Um, you're working for sometimes $5, sometimes $20, and sometimes you have to do some really, really dangerous and stupid matches to actually get a good payday. And he lives in uh, an RV because he can't afford a house. He can barely afford the bills that he's on. And he basically does it whatever he can uh, to kind of just catch that that glimmer, that, that spotlight that he once had. And uh, basically, um, that's the character of Randy, uh, Randy the Ram. He's He's a character in the twilight of his career, uh, working um, basically small venues where he is widely respected uh, in the locker room. Everyone respects him to the max because of what he was. He's respectful to everyone in the locker room. He's not an asshole to any of the promoters or fans or anything like that because he loves the sport. He's passionate about the sport. He lives and breathes the sport no matter how much it it has uh, hurt him with whether it be his – his family with his estranged daughter played by uh, Evan Rachel Wood, I believe, yes. um, who also puts in a great performance or him being hung up on uh, his friend who is a stripper played by Marissa Tomei, who also got nominated for this film. And she is fantastic in this movie. Um, he really has no friends. Uh, and that's, that, that's, that's the one dark thing about a lot of pro wrestlers is that uh, you, depending on how deep you go into this career, and how badly you want it, you tend to lose a lot of friends and family in the process because you're always trying to get to the next show, the next venue, and trying to get that that brass ring. And your fa- friends and family fall by the wayside, and that's basically what has happened to him. Obviously, he was going through the '80s era, you know, drugs, rock and roll kind of thing. So he kind of ruined his all of a sudden, and he's trying to get him back, um, but his body just can't handle the abuse anymore that's why i retired because my body couldn't handle the abuse from it anymore and watching this movie honestly kind of gave me some some scary flashbacks especially the hardcore scene which anyone who sees the movie is going to know the scene uh i've had to do stuff like that it's stupid i would never do those again but you do it because you get paid more to do it and the after effects as you can and, and they do it beautifully in the film too where you see the end of the match and then they go right to the back and they're starting to take care of them. And they start flashing back to where these injuries occurred. And you're like, why would someone do that? Well, you do it for the adrenaline. You do it for the love of the fans. And you do it for the money. And But how much of a toll does it take on you after that? And you see what happens to him in the movie. I'm not going to spoil that. Um, Mickey Rourke puts on a phenomenal performance as Randy the Ram. And his trials and tribulations that he goes through this film – and the stuff he puts himself through, and the, and the way he feels through this room, I felt that deep down in my soul because I've been through that for 14 years. I I know that now. I wasn't. I, I'm nowhere near his age. I, I I never had what he had and lost it. And him, he's trying to get it back. So I can't. I'm a I'm a glimmer compared to the spotlight that he had as as a character in this film. But knowing how that locker room is, and and the way they shot this film, they did not shy away from the, the, the hardships and, and the tough stuff that the wrestlers have to go through. They did not um, try to keep the the magic or the majestic hidden away from you. They use terminology in the film that is really used in a locker room. They show you exactly how the wrestlers talk to each other in the locker room. The only they, There's a few things that didn't get quite right, which that's fine. Don't give away everything. But I'd say about 95% of what they show in the locker room and the way the wrestler's life is, is really, really true. Uh, and with that, I can do nothing more than respect the hell out of um, Darren Aronofsky, who I'm not definitely a big fan or of, of his films, and I'll, Brian isn't either. But this movie is amazing. It's heartbreaking. It's 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 a tough watch for anyone who is an aspiring pro wrestler or who's a pro wrestling fan or who was a pro wrestler like I was. For people who are not fans of pro wrestling, who don't understand the sport, who just think, oh, it's that fake stuff, which first off, don't even get me started on that. But uh, 
it, maybe this is not the movie for you. You're watching it more for the performances, which are incredible, and not about what the actual story itself isn't telling. But for anyone who's lived that life, and for anyone who wanted to have that kind of life, or who's a fan of the people who do that life, this movie does it to perfection. Uh, and I could not recommend this film more. Uh, Brian... Uh, you got to watch little bits and pieces of it. You didn't get to watch the whole thing. Well, I've, I've seen the movie before, so I just kind of, I just kind of refreshed myself on a, a lot of scenes to try to bring up everything I could because I didn't have it handily available. But I, I have seen the movie before. Um, one of the reasons I wanted I, I suggest we do this movie last is because I knew that you are so passionate about it. You have such a personal connection to it, and you'd have a lot to say about it. So uh, I'm not going to have near as much to contribute. But um, I think one thing that's interesting is I'm coming at this movie from a whole different angle, whereas, you know, you were really into the, the whole the whole wrestler and the wrestling aspect and his career and things like that. I was coming at it as somebody who sees the wrestling in this movie as the backdrop. And I was way more into the relationships, him and his daughter, his estranged daughter, as he's trying to try and get back in her life and make sure that she doesn't hate him. Um, him and uh, Marissa Tomei's character, who Marissa Tomei, first of all, you can try to make her look grungy and horrible. That she's, I'm still gonna love her and everything she that's, does. Yeah, that's the one thing. It's like we're all like, "Ew, get away from me, old lady!" Like she looks fucking amazing in yeah, this. They're, they're like, "Oh, she's getting too old to be a stripper." I'm like, "Looks good to me." Just looks insane. Gorgeous in this. But film. I mean, but I mean, even but her acting performance obviously is great. Again, Oscar nominated. Mickey Rourke, I don't tend to like as an actor most times, but I thought he played this role excellent. But for me, like I said, it was a lot more about the relationships, not so much about the wrestling. And I think that the acting, uh, I think everything connected very well. It hit home very well. Um, the story I, I thought was well told. It's it's not, you know, it's it's not long. It's under two hours long. So it doesn't always say it's welcome, but it tells the kind of the complete story. And uh, I, I honestly kind of look at it differently now, having talked to Sean about it a lot because he's very passionate about it and hearing him talk about his career and hearing him talk about this movie, I can see how it'd be uh, very personal for him. Yeah. It's uh, it was hard to watch. I, 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 I remember when I watched it the first time I was actually injured from wrestling and I didn't know I was going to be able to come back. I, I didn't well, the conversations I ever had with you. You were just listening off to all the injuries that you had. Yeah. It, and a lot of people still wonder how I, how I walk around like a normal human being yeah. <laughs> or, or even alive. But it's fake, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things where uh, at the time it came out, um, like I said, I was I was seriously injured. Um, I did not know if I was going to get back in the ring or not. Um, so watching this held uh, very was very very rough for me to watch this film. Oh, so I didn't know the timing of this. So this is right about the time you were you were stopping. No, I had a uh, I had um, tore my ACL, MCL, and meniscus in my right knee, and I was in the process of an 18 month uh, mm. um, out with an injury. And I didn't know if I was ever going to come back to wrestle mm. because the knee wasn't healing properly. And, um, you know, I could, I could jog and do stuff, but it was, it was one of those things where wrestling started to feel like it was getting further and further away from me. Um, I was, uh, I didn't know if I was going to come back. Uh, and then um, seeing this movie <coughs> actually timeline wise is really weird. Um, I saw this movie and it kind of, rejuvenated me like it was a hard it was hard to watch and even now watching it uh, this past week uh i don't want to use the term ptsd because i know that's that's really really dark deep stuff for for military people but watching like the hardcore stuff and watching stuff he goes through like today maybe just like it made my body ache because i i could feel the pain he was going through in the matches because i felt that pain and felt the the when your body is giving up on you but you're hearing the crowd egg you on for more and you just have to get up and keep going because you know, if you, if you can't continue, you're not letting yourself down. You're not letting your opponent down. You're letting everyone in that stadium who paid for you down. And so I, I, I felt that uh, to my core and uh, I know we're getting off topic from movies now, but um, and I apologize, but that's how, that's how raw this movie is to me. But honestly, seeing that movie, I believe, uh, if my if my timeline's correct, um, it might have been actually a year later. If I'm thinking about it, it was, it was either and like I said, that's the twelve concussions coming. It was, it was either that very next month or it was a year later in February. I actually went back into the ring and um, I went to a show, kind of like how he does in the way he went to the show just to watch. And they had me get in the ring and work with a newbie and say, "Hey, Sean, why don't you run him around real quick? Just see if he can run a show or run a match." 
And I, I went in, it was the first time I had been in the ring in 18 months. And I uh, just kind of was going to go through the motions and everything just seemed to work. And they came up to me afterwards and like, so how, how was he? I was like, oh, he's good. I was like, he could put on a match tonight. They go, how are you? And I was like, I'm fine. You know? And they're like, can you do that again tonight? And I was like, you want me to wrestle tonight? They go, well, you looked great. Like, we want you back tonight. And I'm like, I am not in shape. <laughs> like, I looked like shit. Like, I, I had, <laughs> I had a big stomach. Like, I was not in, in wrestling shape. But it's one of those things where, and, and, and that, and that, it's like that in the pro wrestling circuit. Whenever you go to a show, even if you're not on the card, you always bring your gear because you never know when your time's going to get called. And I brought my stuff, not even remotely thinking I was going to work. And they're like, we want you to do this exact same thing with him again tonight because this was his first match. And like, we don't trust anyone else but you to, to do this with him. And uh, we went out there and we put on that same match. And then I looked at the photos and the video afterwards. I'm like, I look horrible. And I basically put myself in serious shape and lost like 30, 40 pounds in like two months. I got myself in, back into the wrestling ring. And I, I went for another four years until concussions basically overdid me. But it was this kind of film, go seeing that yeah. kind of stuff, which this week was a little bit south. But it was it was that stuff that got me back in the ring. So that's, that's why this movie's so passionate and so so personal. I was gonna say it, it feels like I know you said you feel like you went off on a tangent, but this really just kind of informs people to how much this movie meant to you. Well, it's not it's not even just this movie. It, this is how movies in general to people are. There are some movies that just watch movies and they're just being entertained, like a, like a you know, the MCU, like Captain America, Guardians of the Galaxy, where they just, it's a movie that makes them feel good. It makes them feel great. And then there are certain movies that just touch you in, into your soul and, and you personally to the point where it can change you. It can change the way your life goes from then on. It changes the way you see things differently. And it, it holds so much more weight. And this is a movie, like, and I've always said this to Brian, I've said this to many other people, your favorite films like the ones that are really, really good, like like Fifty Shades of Black, for instance. Yes, like Fifty Shades of Black. You will watch. You can only watch those movies maybe a handful of times because they take so much out of you while watching them. Like honestly, I think this is maybe watching it for the show this week. This was probably only the third time I have watched really? the record wow. because it's. It, it, it just takes a lot out of me to watch this kind of film and watch. I can see that with with more of a dramatic stuff. With like, if you if like you know comedies and action movies are one thing, but like the dramas that really touch you, yeah. Yeah, but like comedies, you can watch. You can watch like Super Troopers or something like that twenty times to a hundred times. It's good, but like the pet, like the powerhouse, like dramas, like this or like I really really liked Three Billboards and Manchester by the Sea. I've only seen them the one time. Will I ever rewatch those again? I have no idea because it's not something I really want to go. Let's watch this really, really sad film. It's <laughs> phenomenal, but let's go to that headspace. And the wrestler is one of those things where it's like, I don't, it's, it's one of my favorite films. I just don't want to get put myself in that headspace. But when we saw this pop up on our weekend, it was the quickest. I have my movie. Yeah. And I was like, it, this is it. This is my movie. If it's not our feature, it's my pick. I have to get this out. I have to talk about it. And that's the power of movies is that you could take one movie and we, we shit on a lot of movies. We do. And a lot of people will, but I'm not going to defend 50 shades of black, but maybe Paul Blart. We'll use Paul Blart. As a there story. might be somebody out there who really that, loves that movie. There might, be, there might be that guy. That's a mall cop. That's always wanted to be a cop. And Paul Blart speaks to him and we are shitting on it and stuff like that. And we're we're not in that person's shoes. We're not in that person's mindset. Some people might hate the wrestler. Some people might not like pro wrestling. Trust me, there's plenty out there, and I hear it all the time. <laughs> but they, if they have not walked in those shoes, if they have not laced up those boots and not stepped in that ring and taken those hits and, and been in the awe of that crowd, you don't know what you're talking about. Same thing for people who are X Games people or football players, baseball players, um, cops. If you have an end of watch – is phenomenal that is a phenomenal film it is a hard watch and i know friends of mine who are cops who watched it who are saying it's one of the best movies they've ever seen they cannot watch that movie again because it is it is too rough to get through 
Uh, it's it. That's the power of movies, and that's why we do this stuff. That's why we talk about the movies. That's why we 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 do shows like this, whether it be reviews or a show like this where we're just talking about movies that we love or don't love in terms of Fifty Shades of Black. Uh, there are movies out there that you're just incredibly passionate about. Brian, you got those movies. We will talk to. We'll talk about them at some point. Uh, but this is one of those movies. I don't get super super passionate about lots of. I usually just like that movie was great. That sucks. Da 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 da. This one, obviously, I got super serious about it. I know probably most people probably have stopped watching or moved on or what have you. But this was one of the movies that I um, definitely wanted to take the time to talk about. Now, next week, we could probably be talking about other movies that are <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing like that at all. And you guys yeah, remember us personal next week now. No, no I'm, look, I'm looking at the list I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not going to be this heavy. Um, but yeah, uh, for people who have still kept watching, uh, I appreciate it. If you guys have any comments or want to talk about this film or pro wrestling in general in a respectful manner, feel free to contact me. I will gladly talk to you guys about it. Um, there's many people in this community that are wrestling fans that have, have reached out to me and who have talked to me about my career and, and the stuff that I've gone through and lived through. And um, it's definitely a different life. Uh, you almost have to have almost like a split personality to kind of deal with the life that of a pro wrestler. And I'm not saying that that's any different than like a rock star or an actor or anything like that, but it is, it is a different kind of life all in general. Um, but yes, that is weekend crusaders this week. Uh, we had horrible films. We had teenage films. We had Westerns. We had, and then we had this film. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you guys did go ahead, hit that like share and subscribe button, leave your comments below. If you guys are fans of these films, even though you guys don't really leave comments at all, but still, if you do, do. Uh, don't forget to follow us on all the social media outlets you see below. Uh, next week, um, little hints, we have a superhero film that is criminally underrated that should have gotten at least one sequel. It never did, and that hurt me because I knew as soon as I saw this movie, I was like, this is not going to get a sequel, and it deserves a sequel so damn bad. Um, we have a, another spoof movie, but this one – just knows how to be a spoof movie. Uh, we have a sci-fi film um, as well. That's all we're going to say about that one. Uh, Brian has a thriller that I have never seen before. So I'm actually excited to see about that because the way he pitched it to me, I'm all for it. And it's then, a thriller with a very notable cast that a lot of people haven't seen. Exactly. When he when he, when he he brought it up, I was like, I don't know what that movie is. He's <laughs> like, oh, we got this person, this person. Yeah, I don't know what that movie is. <laughs> So uh, we got that, and then we also have a a movie that I think the initial intent was to poke fun at people like us in this community, but it actually is a very heartwarming comedy, I feel, um, by the end of it. So those are our picks for next week. Figure out what those movies are. If you guys figure them out, put them in the comments below. Until next time, my name is Sean Wasserkrug. That is Brian Michaels. And in case we don't see you, good morning, good afternoon. And good night, Movie Crusaders, and have a great night. You're still here? It's over. Go home.